So uh, let's now uh, move over to the second invited talk uh, of the session. So, uh, yeah, please and share. Yeah. Thank you. So, and our next speaker is going to be um, Zara Winkler, who uh, completed uh, her PhD at the University of Innsbruck in 2013 on termination tools and automated reasoning. Um, uh, later worked as uh, a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, um, uh, was a Hertha Firnberg fellow uh, uh, and worked as a uh, later in Verona and Bolzano. She was an invited speaker at FSCD 2019 and has worked on a number of topics in uh, rewriting and automated reasoning, such as Knuth Bendix completion, uh, constraint rewriting, uh, techniques for termination proving, to, uh, for inferring time complexity bounds. And uh, uh, today's talk is going to be about decidable fragments, first order logic via termination of rewriting. So um, over to you, Zara. Please share your screen. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation and the opportunity to present my work here. So this talk will be about decidable fragments of first order logic uh, using termination of rewriting. It's joint work with Maria Paola Bonacina and it was done while I was still in Verona. So you see the arena in the background here. So let me start by trying to convey the big picture. So we consider first order theorem proving where a tool gets a set of clauses as input and tries to decide whether this clause set is satisfiable or unsatisfiable. However, due to undecidability, in general, um, the tool may fail because no finite proof exists. Now, a decidable fragment is a subset of first order formulas um, of uh, input for theorem provers that admits a decision procedure such that in theory, the tool can always say sub or unsub. So uh, several such fragments are known, for instance, the Ackermann guarded PVD, um, Bernays Schoenfinkel fragment. And in this talk, I will uh, present new decidable classes of first order logic called the restraint, the sort restraint and the controlled fragments. They will be uh, decidable by variance of resolution and the method called SGDS that I will try to explain. And these fragments share the property that decidability stems from the existence of a suitable order on atoms. And so to uh, check whether such a suitable order exists, we can exploit termination tools from the area of rewriting. So a part of this talk is based on an Ichkar paper of last year, in particular, the restraint fragment, but the remainder of the material is actually new. So this is an outline of the talk. Um, in the first part, I will explain the restraint fragment, which is decidable by resolution methods. So I will beforehand briefly explain hyper-resolution. In the second part of the talk, I will um, um, describe the fragments that are decidable by SGDS. So I will start by outlining how this method works and then present, present the sort restraint and the controlled fragments before concluding with some experiments. Okay, so let's get started with hyper-resolution. So throughout this talk, I will consider a first order set of input clauses S without equality. So, we call a clause positive if it contains only positive literals. And then positive hyper-resolution is very easy to define. It has a single inference rule where we have a number of premises. So the first n premises, L, I, or D, I, are positive clauses. And then we have one additional premise that contains as many negative literals as we have positive clauses, so we have L1 prime to not L1 prime to not Ln prime. And all the remaining literals in this subclause C are positive. In addition, we demand that the literals L 
1 L1 prime to Ln Ln prime are simultaneously unifiable by some MGU sigma. And in this case, we can then conclude with the clause D1 to Dn or C instantiated by sigma. So yeah, that's it. Hyperresolution was already considered by Robinson and he proved that it's a complete method. So uh, S is unsatisfiable if and only if we can derive the empty clause by hyperresolution. Actually, in addition, we also need factoring, but factoring doesn't add much to the reasoning that is uh, relevant for this talk, so I will ignore it for now. And yeah, we by this uh, set rest H star of S, we will denote the set of all hyperresolvents and factors generated from S. So a positive hyperresolution step can just be seen as a combination of multiple resolution steps. And it's known that positive hyperresolution creates only positive clauses. Yeah, so here the choice of the sign is somewhat arbitrary. We can also define negative hyperresolution in a completely analogous way. So let's look at an example. This is a problem from TPTP, thousands of problems for theorem proving, that encodes a binary counter with three bits. So we have these five clauses. Now, what can we do here with hyperresolution? Well, for instance, we can uh, take the first two clauses. Uh, P11 is 111 is positive. It unifies with a single negative literal in the second clause. So just like in a resolution step, we can get P110. Okay, and then we can uh, add this clause to our set and we can continue to perform hyperresolution using the new clause. So we obtain P101 uh, and we can keep going to obtain further clauses until after a number of steps, we obtain P000, which in another hyperresolution step um, yields the empty clause. So we conclude that the clause set is unsatisfiable. Now note that all the clauses that we generated are not only positive, which uh, as I said before is known by hyperresolution, but in this case, all the generated clauses are also ground. Okay, so you might say, I mean, uh, this example is uh, boring because hyperresolution does just the same as resolution. So let's look at a different example where hyperresolution is a bit more effective. So this is another problem uh, from TPTP, which states, uh, which asks to prove the following claim. If six persons meet at the party, then we can always choose three persons out of them that who are either familiar with each other or not familiar with each other. And this is formalized by having six constants for persons and the predicate person, um, a predicate diff that explains that these persons are different. And then we have one clause uh, that expresses that if you have two persons and they are different, then they are familiar with each other or they are unfamiliar with each other. And in addition to clauses that state the negated conjecture. So for this problem, we can do a proper hyperresolution step. It's not a resolution step. Using this clause D, we see that there are three negative literals and we can find three positive uh, clauses, unit clauses here in the input that unify uh, with the respective literals. So we obtain a new clause that we add to the set and then we can uh, keep going. So after a number of steps, quite many actually, we did not derive the empty clause. So this clause set would be satisfiable. And this is somewhat unexpected because we wanted to prove this claim here. And it turns out that the formalization that was originally added to TPTP actually has a bug because familiarity is not symmetric. But the question that I want to raise here is that, um, was it a coincidence that we terminated here? So, because in principle, we could also perhaps go on forever. So again, um, let me point out the fact that all the generated clauses are not only positive, but also round. Okay. So, so much about hyperresolution. Let me explain the restraint fragment. So for this, we need one uh, definition that's already known. So we call a clause C positively ground preserving if every variable in C occurs in a negative literal. 
For instance, if we look at this clause from the binary counter problem, then there are two variables, x and y, and both occur in the negative literal, so this clause is fine. On the other hand, if we have a clause like this, then we have three literals, x, y, and z, but z does not occur in any negative literal, so the clause is not positively ground preserving. Okay, it's uh, known that hyper-resolution, if run on a set of clauses that is positively ground preserving, will only generate ground clauses. So this uh, now already sets the stage to explain the basic idea of restraintness. So let's consider again this clause set for the binary counter example. So we had five clauses. Then we can check that the clause set is positively ground preserving. So the only positive clause is ground. There is nothing to be checked. In the second clause, we have uh, these two variables x, y that also occur in the first negative literal. And similarly for the third clause and the remaining clauses are again ground. And if we now look at the hyper-resolution tree, so these are the clauses that I showed on the slide beforehand, then uh, we see that not only all the clauses that are generated are ground, but I mean, if you look at these uh, generated um, unit clauses on the bottom here, they seem to get smaller. For instance, if we consider their arguments as a string of bits. And if we look at the inference mechanism, then this is actually not a coincidence that we get a finite derivation here because the clauses, the mixed clauses that we used for the hyper-resolution step, so it is not PXY1 or PXY0, and the other one actually have the property that the atom of the negative literal is larger, for instance, with respect to a lexicographic path ordering with suitable precedence. So the atom of the negative literal is larger than the atom of the positive literal. And this caused, uh, seemed to cause this uh, decrease of the clauses that we generated. So this is the basic idea of restraintness. But now uh, I will make this formal. So a restraining quasi-ordering is a quasi-ordering on terms and atoms that has three properties. First, it's stable under substitution. Second, the strict part of this ordering is well-founded. And finally, we demand that the equivalence relation induced by this quasi-ordering has equivalence classes that are finite. And now we define a restrained clause as follows. A clause C is positively restrained with respect to a restraining quasi-ordering if it satisfies two properties. First of all, it's ground preserving. And secondly, we demand that for every non-ground positive literal L in C, so C plus is the subclause of C that contains all the positive literals, so for every positive literal L, there exists a negative literal not M in C, such that M is greater or equal than L. And uh, we extend this definition to a clause set in a natural way. So the clause set is positively restrained if all its clauses are so. So if you reconsider the example that we had on the previous slide, then, I mean, um, we already observed that it's ground preserving this system. So it remains to check the second condition, namely that for every non ground positive literal in clauses, and those are those that are highlighted in, in green now, there exists a negative literal in the same clause such that the atom of the negative is greater than the atom of the positive. And as already hinted at before, we can, for instance, orient these respective atom pairs by a lexicographic path order. Okay, now, TPTP also contains uh, problems where this orientation is not so easy. For instance, many problems contain permutative uh, classes with permutative atom pairs, for instance, not diff x, y, or diff y, x. So of course we cannot orient these atoms strictly. So here is where the quasi order comes into play. 
we can choose a quasi order that makes these two term pairs, these two atom pairs equivalent. For instance, using Alex, uh, associative and commutative RPO, where diff is an AC symbol. And uh, this choice of ordering also satisfies the final condition on the restraining quasi ordering, namely that equivalence classes are finite. Okay, now, um, I mean, we are interested in decidability. So the key lemma that we showed uh, to prove that the restraint fragment is decidable by hyper-resolution is the following. We showed that if we have a positively restrained clause at S, then all the atoms in positive clauses that are generated by hyper-resolution, so again, these are the clauses generated by hyper-resolution, so all these atoms are in this set, which is defined as the set of all atoms that are smaller or equal than a positive ground atom in the input set. And uh, one can observe that this is a finite set due to uh, well-foundedness and finiteness of equivalence classes. And it moreover contains only ground terms. So we call this a finite basis. Okay. and. Um, since we showed now that hyper-resolution produces only clauses with atoms that come from a finite ground set, we can obviously build only finitely many clauses with that. So hyper-resolution on a positively restrained set will terminate. And in fact, by a similar argument, also positive resolution terminates. So the positively restrained fragment is decided by positive resolution methods. Now, the choice of the sign was so far completely arbitrary. So I will continue to talk about the positively restrained fragment and, uh, and positive hyper-resolution, but I just wanted to remark that we could just as well also consider negative hyper-resolution that decides the negatively restrained class. But the definition of negative restraintness is just obtained from the definition of positive restraintness by flipping all the signs. Okay, now, um, since it relies on the existence of an ordering, restraintness is unfortunately an undecidable property. So, and that's where uh, termination tools from the area of rewriting can come to help. So, we define a restraining rewrite system for a clause set S as follows. So, we demand that this system RS contains for every clause C in S and every non ground positive literal L in C, a clause. Uh, sorry, a rule M goes to L, such that not M is a negative literal in the same clause. And then we can show that if the rewrite system terminates, then S is indeed restrained with respect to the restraining quasi ordering that we obtained by taking the reflexive and transitive closure of the rewrite system, rewrite relation. So in order to check to obtain a partial check whether a clause set is restrained, we can construct candidate rewrite systems and check termination with termination tools. And in order to uh, deal with uh, this a bit more, a bit harder to handle atom pairs like the diff clause that I showed beforehand, in our experiments, we use relative termination. So for permutative atom pairs, we make relative rules out of such atom pairs and demand that the resulting system terminates relatively with respect to those. So for some examples, so we already saw these binary counter systems. We have two clauses that contain non-ground positive literals, the second and the third one. And for every one of those clauses, we have only a single choice of the rewrite rule. So we have a single possibility for RS as a restraining rewrite system and termination is easy to show. Now, also for this party problem that we I showed beforehand. So this is a single clause in this clause set that it contains both positive and negative literals. And in addition, the, we can check that this clause set is ground preserving. So we only have to look at this clause. And so in order to satisfy the requirement of restraintness, we again look for positive non-ground literals, which are here this fum xy and unfum xy. So we need to create rules that have these positive 
atoms as right-hand sides, and we need something on the left-hand side that occurs in the same class. And actually, the only choice here, because of the variables, is diff x, y. So we obtain this restraining rewrite system. And again, of course, any termination tool will recognize termination. Now here, we, uh, for these examples, we just had a single possibility for the restraining rewrite system. But in general, TPTP contains uh, problems that are a bit uh, more nasty in this respect. For instance, there are problems like this one, which are more of a parametric, so they exist in multiple versions in TPTP. With clauses like the following, we have not P1x or not Q1x or R1x up to not PKx or not QKx or RKx. And now for every single clause, we have two possibilities to add a rewrite rule. Either P1x goes to R1x or Q1x goes to R1x. So in total, we obtain an exponential number of possibilities for restraining rewrite systems. This is just one possibility. And uh, in this case, all of them would be terminating, of course. OK. So, so much about the restrained fragment. Um, the remaining fragments are not decidable by resolution methods, but by a method called SGGS, um, which is a short form for semantically guided goal sensitive reasoning. So I will start by giving an outline of this method, which however will be pretty high level because um, I, I don't have time to explain the details here. But the general idea of SGGS is um, to do something like DPLL or CDCL for first order. So we do a model construction in a conflict-driven way. So this picture gives a very general outline. So we have a set of input clauses S, and we start with some initial interpretation I, which will be a Herbrand interpretation. Then we check whether the interpretation satisfies the clause set. If this is the case, we are already done. We can conclude satisfiability. Otherwise, we extend our interpretation to make up for the problem that we found. If the interpretation constructed in this way is consistent, we can just keep going and repeat this loop. And otherwise, we try to fix the interpretation. If this works, we can uh, keep uh, repeating the loop. But it may also happen that at some point we cannot fix the interpretation anymore and we have to conclude unsatisfiability. So this is a very high uh, level view. To make this a bit um, more precise, here are the main ingredients that SGGS uses. So this initial interpretation will, for the rest of the, this talk, be very simple. It will be either I minus or I plus, where by I minus, I mean the interpretation that makes every atom false, and I plus is the interpretation that makes every atom true. Moreover, we need Herbrand constraints, which are a form of uh, syntactic constraints that take one of two shapes. Either we have, um, so these Herbrand constraints are conjunctions of constraints of one of two shapes. The first is a constraint of the form top X is different from F which uh, expresses that whatever we substitute for x doesn't have f as a root symbol. And the second constraint form that we have is x different from y for two variables, x and y. OK, so we consider these Hebron constraints in conjunction with clauses. So a constraint clause is a pair of a Hebron constraint and a clause. For instance, this would be a constraint clause, which expresses that if whatever we substitute for x is not rooted by f, then not p of a or q of a, and whatever we substitute for x holds. Usually, we will select one literal per class, which is indicated by the orange brackets. And SGDS now works by um, maintaining a trail, which is a sequence of constrained clauses, and this trail encodes the current Herbrand interpretation. And uh, the method defines an inference system that modifies such trails. OK, so rather than giving the precise definition of the inference rules, 
I will try to convey an impression by showing an example. So we can consider SGDS as a game between two players. We have the owl, which is a meticulous proof checker, and we have the koala, its antagonist, which is a lazy guy who tries to find the simple solution. Okay, so the owl wants to know whether the formula is satisfiable. Then one possibility as a lazy way to, to try to solve the problem is to just interpret all atoms as false. So we make a guess for an interpretation. So this corresponds to an SGDS inference sequence where we use the initial interpretation I minus, everything interpreted as false. Then the owl notices that the first clause P of A has to be satisfied and with I minus it isn't. Okay, then the um, koala may, may reply, all right, we modify our interpretation. We make P of A true and otherwise we do as before. So everything else is false. And we remember this decision by putting the clause P of A on the trail and selecting the literal that we want to make true. And this is called an extension. At this point, however, the owl notices that if we make P of A true and everything else false, there is an instance of the second clause which is not satisfied, namely not PA or QAY or RA. Okay, so the response might be that, uh, all right, then we also satisfy QAY. And again, we remember this by putting the clause instance on the trail and selecting the literal that we want to make true. Now there is another problem, however, namely that if QAY is true, then the third clause, and more precisely an instance, not QAA of it is not satisfied. So we also satisfy not QAA, we also add this literal on the trail. But now we observe that there is a conflict, there is a contradictory, um, contradictory selected literals. And now to solve this, um, what is done is we do a case distinction on the variable y in the second clause. So we replace this clause by two versions. In the second version, we substituted y by a. And in the first version, we add a Herbron constraint saying that the top of y is different from a. This is called a split. And then we do some conflict solving magic. So in particular, we resolve the two literals QAA with not, so the clause where we selected QAA with the unit clause not QAA. We obtain this clause, we select another literal. So we end up with another uh, interpretation that makes these four literals true and everything else false. And at this point, we indeed reached an interpretation that satisfies the clause. Okay, so I showed this example just to give an impression that SGGS is a conflict-driven method that constructs interpretations in a certain way. I just want to state some facts about the method. So it was show, proven to be complete, both reputationally and model complete. And we showed now uh, something interesting about this method, namely, if we have a positively ground preserving clause set and the set of clauses that is generated by hyper-resolution from this set is finite, then also all SGGS derivations that use I minus as an initial interpretation are finite. And the proof of this uses um, the observation that the extension mechanism of SGGS resembles hyper-resolution. So in any case, in particular, we get out of this, uh, of this theorem that SGGS with I minus decides the positively restrained fragment as well. Now, in a similar way, we can show that using I plus as initial interpretation, we can decide the negatively restrained fragment. Okay, so why are we interested in SGGS? Well, to decide more uh, problems and um, the next fragment I want to talk about is this sort restraint fragment. So for this, we will move to a many sorted setting. So we consider a set of sorts, sigma, and we assume now that all function symbols and all predicate symbols are assigned some sorts. Okay, now, uh, key property of sorts for um, this definition of the sort restraint fragment is the following. We call 
uh, sort to have infinite domain if there are infinitely many ground terms of that sort. And otherwise, the sort is said to have finite domain. This uh, allows us then to define a stratified clause. So we say a clause set S, or actually the signature is stratified if all the sorts have finite domain. So we don't have any sorts that allow us to construct infinitely many ground terms of that sort. And in this special case, um, so it's, it's known that a stratified fragment includes, first of all, the EPR fragment, so effectively propositional logic or the Bernays Schoenfinkel fragment. And it was also already proven 20 years back that the stratified fragment is decidable, basically because there are only finitely many possibilities for a Herbrand interpretation. It was furthermore shown that also instantiation-based theorem proving decides this stratified fragment and uh, also SGGS does. However, resolution methods, particular hyper-resolution and ordered resolution, unless you do very particular tricks, will not decide this stratified fragment. So the idea of this uh, sort restraint fragment is now the following. Since SGGS decides the stratified fragment, the stratified part of a clause set is harmless for SGGS. The problem may only come from sorts that have infinite domain. And the idea is now that, similar as before, we use the idea of restrainedness to tame the literals that have sorts of infinite domain. So to apply this restrainedness idea in a sorted setting, we first generalize the definition of ground preservingness to take sorts into account. So a clause that a clause C is positively ground preserving for a sort S if all the variables of the sort S in C are contained in a negative literal of C. And this definition can of course be also considered for an entire set of clauses so a set of clauses is positively ground preserving if all its clauses are so. So if we uh, consider this example, we have three clauses. And um, I mean, if we look at the first clause, then it can be seen that this clause is not restrained. So also the clause set is not restrained because there is a variable in this atom which is, uh, forms a unit clause and uh, uh, yeah, so it cannot be controlled by restraintness because it's not ground preserving. Now, if we assign sorts to the symbols, then the most general sorting that we can do um, is the following. So we give the first argument of P sort as one, the second argument of P sort as two, uh, Q takes two arguments of sort S1 and F, so the function symbol F goes from S2 to S2. Then uh, one can note that the clause set is not stratified because the sort S2 has infinite domain. Since we can construct infinitely many terms of this sort, namely B, F of B, F of F of B, um, F of F of F of B. So infinitely many ground terms. However, um, the clause set can be seen to be ground preserving with respect to the sort S2. So if we look at the definition, we only have to check for um, variables of this sort. So variables of sort S2. There is only a single variable that occurs in the red part, which is y in the last clause. And indeed this variable y occurs also in a negative literal of this clause. So the clause and the clause set is ground preserving with respect to S2. And now we can define a sort restraintness using this idea of ground preservingness with respect to a sort. So, a clause C is positively sort restrained by a restraining quasi ordering. If again, two conditions are satisfied. 
First of all, the clause is positively ground preserving, but now only for sorts that have infinite domain. And secondly, we reuse this um, orientation condition that we had for restraintness. So for all positive literals, there exists a negative literal such that the atom of the negative is greater or equal than the atom of the positive literal. But now we restrict this uh, condition to literals that have infinitely many ground instances. And again, a clause set is positively, clause positively sort restrained if all the clauses are. So if we reconsider this example, then we already checked that it's positively ground preserving for the red sort, for S2. And it's easy to check then that it's also positively sort restrained because I mean, the only relevant clause is the last one and the only positive literal with um, some red stuff in it is the last one, PXY and PXFY can be easily made larger than PXY. So this clause set is positively sort restrained. And uh, we show that SGGS using initial interpretation I minus decides the sort restraint fragment using a proof idea that is actually um, similar to what I already mentioned for hyper-resolution beforehand. Namely, we can show that all the atoms that are constructed in such a derivation are in a finite basis. And this finite basis consists of all atoms whose arguments are either terms of sort with finite domain, of which there are finitely many ground ones, or terms of sort with infinite domain that are ground and smaller than uh, the terms that we already have in the input set. And uh, yeah, this proof um, also gives us the small model property, which basically means that we can bound the size of the model that we get from SGDS in case the input set is satisfiable. Okay, so we can also automate uh, a check for sort restraintness in a similar way as we did the check for restraintness, simply by considering only rewrite rules that emerge from atoms that involve sorts of infinite domain. Okay, so um, I don't have so much time left, so I think I will be very fast on this controlled fragment and just try to convey the principal idea. So, if we look at this restraintness criterion, it demands two things. First of all, positive clauses have to be ground, or at least those uh, that have uh, potentially evil sorts. And secondly, it demands that we can control the mixed clauses, so those that contain positive and negative literals, by some ordering. However, this condition one is pretty restrictive, so we would like to get rid of it. So uh, this was the starting point uh, for this uh, work to look into the controlled fragment. Now, one notices that if we just drop restriction, drop this requirement one, then restraintness doesn't work anymore as a decidability criterion. So if you consider these three clauses, then uh, I mean, we have a positive clause that's not ground. So the clause set is not restrained, but the, uh, mm, condition that mixed clauses are controlled by an ordering is trivially satisfied because there are no mixed clauses. However, positive uh, resolution strategies do not terminate and also SGDS may not terminate depending on the selection. And the problem kind of is that if we have ground clauses, uh, sorry, if you have positive clauses that are not ground, then it's insufficient to control the mixed clauses in the input set because we may generate new mixed clauses along the run for which shows holds for both hyper resolution and SGDS. So along the run, we may generate new mixed clauses that we couldn't control in the beginning. Oh, sorry. So here is a typo. This should be um, not, not, not PX or PSX. So the second negation is superfluous. So this generation of new mixed clauses is a problem. And to uh, avoid this, uh, we now restrict to uh, a subset of input sets. Namely, we only consider horn input sets where such mixed clauses cannot be produced. 
So we define a controlling quasi-ordering in a similar way as for the restraining. I don't want to go into details, just mention that we have a pretty restrictive condition here. We demand that L is greater or equal than L sigma for all substitution sigma. We define control in a similar way as uh, we defined restraintness, namely that uh, atoms of negative uh, literals are larger than atoms of positive literals. Now we also demand this for substitutions. But we obtain, in the end, the result about horn clauses. So if we have a controlled set of horn clauses S, then SGDS derivations using I minus hold. Here is an example that can be handled by this criterion, but not by restraintness. Now, the second point I want to mention about controlled sets is, um, well, it's again an undecidable property. But again, we can use termination tools to recognize such sets. So we use the same definition of a restraining rewrite system as beforehand. So for all um, positive uh, at literals, there must be a negative uh, literal that occurs in a rule and goes to L. But now, instead of uh, using termination with respect to rewriting, we use termination with respect to narrowing. So by using a suitable definition of uh, quasi-ordering using a rewrite system that terminates with respect to narrowing, we can show that um, if we can construct a restraining rewrite system for an input clause set S such that narrowing terminates, then we can obtain a controlling quasi-ordering from this set and consequently the set is decidable. However, termination of narrowing is of course a much more restrictive requirement. Okay, I will briefly mention some experiments. So to see whether these decidability criteria are actually applicable, we looked into TPTP. We restrict it to those uh, input sets that have no equality and no series, and we excluded those that have more than 500 clauses to end up with 3,550 potential clause sets. Out of those, we could recognize 413 as restrained using a proof and TTT as termination tools and checking at most 50 candidate rewrite systems. Now, some of them are positively, some of them are negatively restrained, some are both. And here we see a comparison. Um, also, we see how many of those 430 problems are also in other decidability criteria. But we found that 77 of those restrained problems do not fit in any of those earlier known criteria. So they are recognized as decidable to the best of our knowledge for the first time. And we did the same experiment for the uh, sort restraint fragment. Here we obtained 1,000, uh, almost 1,400 sort restraint problems. A large part of them, one has to say, is already stratified. Um, moreover, this uh, fragment, of course, also contains all the restraint problems, but 20 of the problems that we found did not fit in any other class. Repeating the same experiment for the controlled class, however, we did not find any new problems that can be recognized decidable. So I will very briefly mention also that there is an implementation of SGGS called Koala, which is a yeah, first order logic theorem prover based on SGGS. It is not very optimized, so it was really written as a prototype. It doesn't use uh, any termination checking magic inside currently, it just uh, determines to use I plus or I minus depending on ground preservingness. So maybe in the future we can improve on that. So uh, to show some experiments, um, here yeah, I compared Koala with E and Vampire on the three decidable classes that I um, talked about. So in particular, Vampire is of course much stronger to show undecidability, uh, unsatisfiability. But if we look at the satisfiable problems, then um, actually Koala doesn't do so badly. Um, so we're, Vampire shows a couple of problems more satisfiable, but E is, um, also significantly below. So um, we thought it makes sense that uh, Koala is better for satisfiable problems because it's based on a model constructing approach. So if you're interested, then the tool is available. This brings me to the conclusion. So I talked about 
decidable classes of first order logic that we can recognize using um, termination tools of rewriting. The restraint fragment, which is decidable by resolution method, positive resolution methods, um, and also by SGGS. And SGGS, in addition, also decides the sort restraint and controlled fragments. So with this, we can recognize almost 100 new additional TBTB problems that are decidable. Yeah, so uh, we use termination tools to synthesize suitable orderings that witness decidability. And the implementation in this tool Koala shows that um, on these classes, SGGS really seems to behave reasonably. So to mention some open, open questions. So a natural question is, of course, whether we can extend this to first order logic with equality, perhaps by orienting equations. Um, moreover, it would be interesting, I think, to see whether complexity tools can be used to estimate the model sizes and the proof sizes that we get on these fragments. Because basically, I mean, the, the number of decreases in our ordering estimates how, for a hyper-resolution, for instance, how deep the tree can get. So we could, should be able to um, get the bound on the size of the proof or the saturation. And yeah, if you have any ideas for other areas where a similar approach could be applied, I would be very interested. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. So we have time for questions. Uh, so as before, please either just raise your hand or speak into your microphone. I see a raised hand by uh, Chris Lynch. Please speak. Hi. Uh, towards the end, you, you were talking about uh, termination of narrowing and how that applied, but you sort of went a little faster towards the end. Um, it, be, because uh, how, do, how do you use that in your, you didn't actually check for that in your uh, yeah. implementation, right? Thank you for the question. I um, uh, wanted to mention this actually, and then I forgot. So currently we use an approach by uh, Naoki Nishida and uh, German Vidal that reduces termination of narrowing to termination of relative rewriting. But indeed, um, this is uh, maybe not the most powerful thing that we can do. So if you have other ideas how to check for this, um, I would be interested. And yeah, we do have some results on termination of narrowing. So maybe there could be a relationship. OK. That can be checked with uh, tools. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, if you could uh, give me a pointer, I would be very interested. Okay, I, I will send you something. That would be great. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Then we have a question in the chat um, about the computational complexity of SGGS. And the question is, how uh, does complexity of SGGS compare to typical uh, um, uh, CDCL uh, as in Minisat or Stanmark method, DPLL? Okay, um, we tried for some time to, to um, okay, so sorry. Uh, first of all, maybe derivational complexity, I suppose, refers to the number of steps that we can do, right? So, um, I mean, one obvious bound that we that one can derive is um, if we have a finite basis, so for instance, in the ground case, like for DBLL, then the size of a trail, so the size of the representation of the model is bounded. So it's um, exponential in the number of elements in the basis. But uh, we then try to derive from this also a bound on the number of steps that we can do. And I mean, except for, um, for some rather simple cases, we couldn't get anything that was really interesting. So it seems to be still exponential if we have a finite basis. So if all the things, stuff on the trail, for instance, will always be ground, it's um, still exponential. In practice, I don't know whether we can um, observe a difference between DPLL and SGGS. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know whether this answers the question. Uh, well, only uh, 
Ah, okay. The, the chat uh, from the chat, the answer is yes. So, um, more questions? In, in the meantime, I would have a question. Um, what are the challenges for current termination rules? So what do instances look like where neither approve nor TTG2 find an answer, but they come from the, uh, the application? So many problems that we generated for this are actually pretty simple. The more challenging ones come from from relative termination where we either have permutative equations that are simply large or for the narrowing problems. So those I think are much harder for tools than the problems that we generated for, um, for the restraint fragment. Mm, for, for relative termination, the tool uh, nuts by Akiza Yamada uh, may be worth a look. So I believe there uh, has been some progress uh, in uh, dependency pairs adaptations. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I will. Um, I will make a comparison. Other questions? Uh, you. You. In the end, you asked about open questions with uh, other areas. Um, uh, what? An, adapt, an extension to logically constrained rewriting be helpful for first order theorem proving with theories and perhaps or also deal with the equality case? Yeah, I, I guess it would be uh, worth having a look. Um, I mean, I think for the equality case, one, one could just try to, to orient the equalities, but the problem is then to deal with the ground preservingness requirement that we have for restraintness normally. So um, I'm not sure whether this is so easy, but yeah, it would be worth uh, looking into that, I guess. Yeah, so it's the kind of idea that uh looks promising during the talk and may either lead to a paper or just to a lot of uh, seeing why it doesn't work. So, well, <laughs> future work. <laughs> right. Um, okay, more questions? Yes, your... Uh... Well, party problem is about, it's a little bit like Renzi theory. Uh, and I could imagine that you can also make variants of this party problem with higher uh, Renzi numbers, and then it will extremely blow up the complexity. Is it then still feasible, or is it stick 3-3 three, three, the, the highest one that you can do? Um, I'm, so, I'm afraid I'm not exactly sure what you mean by, by Renzi numbers and how they come in here. Well, you say you have, uh, you have six people and there are always three ah, okay. uh, that connect or all the three that do not connect. But if you, if you replace the 633 by other numbers, there are a lot of results on this and there are many open problems in this area and these hard problems and typically uh, extremely blow up exponentially. So I would guess that you can make many variants of this problem, uh, which slightly higher numbers would blow up. Is it still possible, or, or is this the only one of this shape in the in, in, the, in the data set, or is this of this precise puzzle? I'm not sure. Um, so it doesn't have a parametric. It doesn't have the name of a parametric problem. So I think precisely this problem is. Is unique, but it might be that there are similar problems. TPTP contains many similar problems. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as the structure stays the same of the problem, then it would still fit into this restraintness uh, class, of course. Mm. I mean, maybe one should, I should also say that even though that several problems, um, so even though we found uh, many restraint problems that are not so hard, there are also restraint problems that are still super hard for tools. For instance, this binary counter problem exists in a parametrics way. So up to, I think, 30 bits. 
And no tool in DPDP, no tool in CASC can guarantee solve any problem with more than 15 bits. So even though it's decidable, tools may still just fail due to size or okay, thank you. other reasons. But I will look into, into the problem shape, thanks. Thank you. Um, more questions? So if, if at this point there are no uh, further questions, um, this would uh, end the session and uh, we would uh, meet again in about half an hour. Um, so, well, thank you again, uh, first of all, for uh, a very nice talk and uh, which also gives, led to some discussions. So pointers to open questions are always a good thing at, at a workshop. And well, in the next session, uh, we are uh, in the first part going to um, uh, hear a report about the International School on Rewriting, uh, which took place just um, two weeks ago um, in Madrid. Uh, uh, by Nara uh, Thiso, uh, and uh, we will talk about um, hear about the progress made for ISR uh, next year. And in the second part of the session will be uh, the business meeting, which, well, ISR is public. Where uh, in contrast, the business meeting is uh, will be just for uh, group members. But I encourage everyone. Um, uh, to uh, join for uh, the International School on Rewrite. So, well, now is, I think, a good time to get some uh, local coffee. Okay, thank you again for the discussion.